We're beginning, we'll be beginning at verse 42 of Luke 11, and we're going to find the Lord pronouncing six woes here on certain people. Now, this happened somewhat previous to a, the, a similar situation that we have recorded in the 23rd chapter of Matthew, where he pronounces seven woes upon the scribes and the Pharisees. Uh, I suppose uh, he found more to pronounce as he went along. Uh, some of them, some of the woes pronounced here are uh, identical to those in Matthew. However, there's some there that aren't here, and there's some here that aren't there. So, uh, and the uh, setting is a little different. happened uh, maybe a few months earlier in the ministry of the Lord Jesus Christ. But first he says in verse 42, But woe unto you Pharisees, for ye tithe mint and rue and all manner of herbs, and pass over judgment and love of God. These ought ye to have done, and not to have left the other undone. What he is doing here is accusing them of observing the uh, minor, uh, of minor importance, the uh, procedures uh, these that would have an outward show and leaving the uh, the true heart part of uh, following uh, Jehovah out of their lives and of course this is uh, this is the vein of what is called Christianity today if you do much personal witnessing uh, you'll find a large number of people that uh, have no interest in coming to Christ because they have their eyes on that which professes to be Christian, and they see nothing there worthy of immolation. And so uh, uh, the Christianity is given a bad name by what goes for Christianity, you might say, or what, uh, uh, what passes for Christianity. And so we had the same problem there. He says, you pay meticulous attention to the details uh, like uh, you would, uh, you think you're supposed to give a tenth, so you'd give a tenth of the smallest thing. And yet, uh, as far as uh, showing the true love of God, you leave that out. You ought to be doing both. Verse 43, he says, Woe unto you Pharisees. Now, both of these two woes, these first two, are both pronounced against the Pharisees. Woe unto you Pharisees, for ye love uh, the uppermost seats in the synagogues and the greetings in the markets. Uh, he says that uh, you're in the business of religion because you get recognized, and we have some of that too. Uh, it's, uh, it's an occupation that has a degree of uh, 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 applause and acclaim and so forth, and so he says uh, you like to be big wheels, in other words. Then in verse 44, he says, Woe unto you scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for ye are as graves which appear not, and the men that walk over them are not aware of them. Now, in the, in the Matthew account, seven times he says, Woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites. Calling them hypocrites each time. Now, notice this third woe, uh, he adds the scribes to the Pharisees. So it might be well if we if we'd explain the difference. Well, many scribes were Pharisees. And some Pharisees were scribes. Uh, a Pharisee was a sort of a religious political party, uh, and uh, the uh, they were the ones that uh, claimed to be the upholders of the true uh, Jewish traditions. They uh, went big with the uh, Torah and then the Talmud and all the things that had been added uh, by tradition uh, to the original law of Moses. And uh, they made a big show of their religion. They wore the proper attire and all of that, and uh, they made a big show of, of being religious. These were the Pharisees. And uh, the scribes were those who were given charge of the scriptures. Now, there were uh, three basic types of scribes. Uh, one group of scribes were charged primarily with just protecting the veracity of the scriptures. That is to say, uh, to diligently copy it. They spent hours and hours carefully copying and rereading and, and proofreading and so forth. And this is where their names come from. The uh, scribes means writers. They were the writers down of the scriptures. 
But the scribes also uh, interpreted the scriptures. They were uh, pretty much the preachers, too. In other words, they were the teachers, those that taught. Uh, you'll uh, look back in the book of Ezra, and you'll find that uh, Ezra was called a ready scribe. He was a priest, but he was a ready scribe. And he gave the formula as to uh, how to prepare oneself to properly uh, uh, carry on this business of being a teaching scribe. And then over in the book of Nehemiah, we find uh, uh, Ezra, along with other scribes, are the ones that are expounding the scriptures, are opening, the, opening it up, explaining to the people what to do. So this was the second duty of the scribe. Now, the uh, third uh, section or a facet of the duties of the scribe was to interpret the law and to uh, actually uh, serve as a panel of judges and so forth and make sure that people were carrying out the law because they were the ones that were supposed to be able to uh, uh, say this is what the law says. We're speaking about the Mosaic law, but of course in the time of Christ, the Mosaic law together with all that had been added to it by religious tradition. And so uh, these scribes that uh, had this particular charge were also called lawyers. So not all scribes were lawyers, and not, uh, uh, and, but the lawyers were uh, part of the scribe. They're the ones that had to do with uh, interpreting uh, the law. They had that facet of, of the duties. Now, sometimes the two words are used interchangeably. There are two original words uh, used, uh, sometimes translated scribe and sometimes lawyer, but uh, you can't be real sure by the translation just which, uh, the, which was the original word. However, the, uh, the lawyers were part of the scribes. So notice that when uh, the Lord pronounced this uh, woe here in verse 44 upon the scribes and included them with the Pharisees, well, uh, somebody's ears were pricked up, you know, uh, began to listen. Uh, look in verse 45. Then answered one of the lawyers and said unto him, Master, uh, thus saying, thou reproachest us also. He didn't mind as long as he was just saying, uh, you Pharisees are hypocrites, but says, look, you've added us into this. Are you saying that uh, uh, we're like the Pharisees and that uh, are you uh, speaking against us too? And let's see what he said against them. He called them hypocrites in verse 44. And he called them, he said that you're like graves that nobody doesn't know is a grave. What he's saying is that uh, it's as though a cemetery had been obscured and it's got dead people in it and nobody knows anybody's dead and they walk over it just as though it was any other ground. He says, well, the, the people that you come in contact with don't know that you're, you're a, a grave. You're, you're dead. Uh, you're... The, you're the place of the dead and, and you lead other people to where you are. So uh, you don't have any life, in other words. This is what he's saying about them. That you can't produce life and you're just like a grave. And nobody knows you're a grave because they go about uh, around you and about you as though you weren't a grave. Well, the lawyer didn't quite take to this. Uh, but he uh, then he addresses the, wa uh, the lawyers specifically and he's going to pronounce three woes specifically on these lawyers or these uh, that have the responsibility of uh, interpreting the law to the people or telling other people how to live. And their job is to tell people how to please God in their lives. So notice, notice what he says in verse 46. And he said, Woe to, unto you lawyers, unto you also ye lawyers. See? He said, Yeah, I mean you too. Uh, says, uh, for you load uh, men with burdens grievous to be born, and ye yourself touch not the burdens with one of your little fingers. It says, you tell people what they have to do and what the law requires, but you don't live up to it. You just tell other people what they're supposed to do. I remember one time I was making an evening call with one of my agents, and, and the man that we were presenting a life insurance plan to was a, a minister of a particular denomination. Part of their religious polity is that uh, to stay saved, you must live an acceptable Christian life. And they preach this, of course, all the time in their pulpit. So he gets a lot of calls to interpret situations. And uh, so while we were there, two different people called him. 
to ask him if this was permissible, if this was all right. And he would uh, interpret the Bible in his way, of course, and he'd say it was all right or it wasn't all right according to the scriptures, and then they could go ahead and either do it or not do it, you know. So he was a, uh, he was a lawyer. Now, whether or not he was living up to his own prescription, I don't know, uh, but he was prescribing. Well, these people were prescribing, but they weren't living up to their prescription. And he says in verse 47, Woe unto you, for you build the sepulchres of the prophets, and your fathers kill them. Truly you bear witness that you allow the deeds of your father, fathers, for, ye indeed, uh, for they indeed kill them, and ye build their sepulchres. Here's what he's saying. He's saying, look, you're following in the very footsteps of your predecessors. You're doing exactly what they did. And, and you would say in most instances, you're following in their tradition. Now, here's something strange. They killed the true prophets of God, and now you're building monuments to those true prophets. Uh, like, uh, you know, when Jeremiah was a prophet to the people, he wasn't popular at all, was he? Nor was Ezekiel. No, they weren't popular at all. Uh, they, uh, the people didn't like what they said. And uh, so uh, he says, uh, now in one way, you're saying we're doing just like our fathers do, but you're making heroes out of the people that they said were worthy of death. See, that's what they were doing. They were uh, making monuments to the great men of the past and extolling these great leaders. Well, what Christ is saying, if those same men were preaching today, you'd be stoning them. And here you are, building monuments to them. And uh, we tend to do that, don't we? We, uh, in, in, our, in our political life and so forth, uh, we uh, stone the leaders, and then uh, after they're gone, we make monuments to them. Or revere them, or make uh, heroes out of them, so to speak. Well, this is what he's accusing them of doing here. Let's read on in uh, 49. Therefore also said the, wisdom of, said the wisdom of God, and he's quoting here from Proverbs, I will send them prophets and apostles, and of them they shall slay and persecute, that the blood of all the prophets which was shed from the foundation of the world may be required of this generation from the blood of Abel unto the blood of Zechariah who perished between the altar and the temple. Verily I say unto you, it shall be required of this generation. Now what he's saying is this, that all this that's been happening through the ages and all of these people that have been murdered for speaking forth God's word, uh, all of their messages is culminating in this moment. And you're going to put, what he's doing, he's prophesying that they're going to put him to death, the same one. And this is the end of the line, so to speak. And so all of the uh, uh, judgment that God must uh, perform is going to be culminated in their act. You see, these exact same ones to whom he's talking here are the ones that's going to condemn him to death as we get on a little further. And, of course, he knows that. And so that's what he means by this generation uh, uh, is going to... Uh, on them is going to be uh, required the blood or they're going to be responsible for because all of the prophets were really killed in foreview of the murder of Christ. And it's interesting uh, that he names Abel here. This is one of five times that Abel is mentioned in the New Testament. Four times by name and in the book of 1 John uh, he's mentioned as the brother of Cain. Now, it's uh, it's very interesting that he would mention Abel because you see Abel is a declared type of Christ in uh, the book of Hebrews we're uh, told that he typifies Christ in two ways uh, in one way he offered an acceptable sacrifice and thereby proved himself righteous in the sight of God, of God. so he, he was a preview or a figure of Christ in that Christ offered the acceptable sacrifice. And then uh, we're told also in the book of Hebrews that though he's dead, yet he speaks. Abel does. 
Well, is there somebody else that speaks, although he's dead? Yes, see, he Abel typifies Christ. Now, this uh, this uh, individual Abel is a very interesting individual because he's the first in a long line of people that typify some aspect of Jesus Christ and are said to be so in the New Testament. He heads the list of those in um, in the great faith chapter. It says, by faith Abel offered uh, an acceptable sacrifice. That's not the exact word, is it? More acceptable sacrifice. Uh, that's uh, and He's the, the first of the list. You see, Abel typifies the dying Christ. The next man that's mentioned is Enoch. By faith, Enoch was translated. And Enoch uh, prefigures the living Christ. And the next man that's issued, uh, that's mentioned, mentioned in that 11th chapter of Hebrews is Noah. And Noah typifies the saving Christ. You see these men that you see mentioned there and you go right on down the line and you could find some way in which each one of them prefigures Christ. All of these are mentioned in that hall of faith, we say, in God's hall of faith in uh, uh, Hebrews chapter 11. Now, look at the ways in which Abel typifies Christ. They were both shepherds, weren't they? And in both cases, uh, they were put to death by their own kinsmen because they worship God, God's way. And because uh, someone else didn't want to worship God, God uh, uh, God's way. And that's the only reason that Abel died, and that's the only reason Christ died, from a human standpoint. So you see, uh, uh, he typified Christ. They both, uh, they, they both are said to be prophets. See, Abel is said here to be a prophet. He says, all of the prophets from Abel on that. So Abel was called a prophet. Abel was, uh, so was Christ called a prophet. He was called that prophet that shall come. God shall raise up a prophet. That he's prophesied uh, as being that prophet back in the book of Deuteronomy. So, and the one outstanding characteristic of both of these individuals is their righteousness and how they manifested their righteousness. When Christ talked about Abel in uh, Matthew, uh, he called him righteous Abel. And uh, he's also called that in uh, in Hebrews. So uh, they're both uh, declared to be prophets, both declared to be righteous, uh, both speak, though they're dead, they're said to speak uh, in their death and beyond their death, and they both are said to have offered an acceptable sacrifice. And you could go on with the analogy, but what Christ is doing, he's pointing out someone who looks forward to himself, who is a, a prefigure of him. Now, what about this fellow, Zechariah? Well, Zechariah happens to be the name of about 28 or 9 people in the Bible. And uh, there are two very prominent Zechariahs. One is uh, the prophet who wrote the prophecy of Zechariah, the next to the last book in the Old Testament, some 500 years or so before Christ was born. And the other prominent Zechariah was the father of John the Baptist. Uh, but there were other uh, Zechariahs. This is one of the 20-some other ones. This is neither uh, of the two more prominent ones. And he was uh, stoned to death in the temple yard, as recorded in Second uh, Chronicles, I believe, about chapter 24, somewhere along in that area. Anyway, he's saying all of these uh, were looking forward to that one death uh, that would come. And so he uh, pronounces his sixth woe, his third woe upon the lawyers. Woe unto you lawyers, for ye have taken away the key of knowledge. Ye entered not in yourself, and them that were entering in ye hindered. You know, as I was reading this, I thought back a, an episode in my own life. I used to work with junior high uh, young people, uh, I had a junior high Word of Life Bible Club for about five years. And uh, when I uh, first started, I was going to one of the larger liberal churches in Lakeland, and uh, some of these young people uh, that were in that church kept coming. And so uh, when they got into high school, 
they had a their church had a uh, uh, a week's youth uh, program a youth week and they uh, were given several choices of what they wanted to do uh, have by the way of instruction and they voted on it they could either have a Bible study or they could have lessons on church history or they could have uh, 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 the teenager and so forth or they had about five different things that they could do and uh, what they checked uh, determined who they would invite to come. So uh, the majority checked they would have a Bible study. So then they had to, now this was in a liberal church, but a lot of these kids had been active, had been active in a Bible club. Uh, so th they checked they wanted to have a Bible study for their uh, instructional period during this youth week. And so then uh, they had to get a, a, a Bible teacher. Well, the young man who was the youth director of that church at that particular time uh, had come to some of my Bible classes, and uh, he was, uh, uh, what he was to say, uh, a young man that had salvation, and, and uh, he wasn't exactly straight on everything, but anyway, uh, he loved the Lord. And so uh, uh, someone says, well, why don't you get Mr. Kelso? And he said, that would be great. So he called me up and asked me if I would take this week, uh, you had a, Every night they had one hour of instruction if I would teach the Bible. And they even had picked a, uh, a subject. They, they, he'd given them a, a, a several subjects, and the subject was, uh, was heaven. Is it a real place? That was the subject for the Bible study, you know. Of course, uh, if they'd have got me to teach it, it would also have been hell. Is it a real place? Uh, but anyway, uh, so he called me on the phone. This young fellow did and said, look, I want to tell you something. He says, our young people want to have a Bible study during youth week, and they've selected you for the teacher. And I says, wonderful. Now, have you checked this with your pastor? And he says, why, no, I don't have to check with the pastor. He's on vacation, and he's not going to be back until the beginning of the week, but he said uh, to handle it my, my, uh, with the young people, anything that they wanted would be fine, whatever I settled on. And I said, well, you don't quite understand. I said, uh, I know that your pastor does not agree at all with uh, uh, with my uh, uh, ministry. As a matter of fact, he thinks that the Bible club is very disruptive uh, to his young people's group, and I don't think he would be happy if he found out. And uh, I won't come unless you check it with him because I don't want to cause confusion. And uh, uh, he said, well, okay, okay. And, but he didn't check it with the pastor. He just said he'd been given full information. So what he did was, the pastor was up at, uh, in North Carolina on vacation, so he sent a, uh, a copy of the program up to him. And the pastor got it on the Thursday before this was supposed to start on a Sunday. And uh, so uh, he got a long-distance telephone call. And the pastor uh, said that he'd have to get somebody else. And he said, well, I can't get anybody else. It's already in the church bullet and everywhere. You told me that whoever the kid selects. said, well, I'm sorry, but you'll have to get somebody else uh, if you're going to have a Bible study. Somebody else but Mr. Kelso will have to teach it. And so uh, he called me up and told me that. And I said, well, what are you going to do, Gene? Uh, and he says, well, he says, a lot of the kids know Judge Welch. And so uh, we decided on him. And I says, well, I said, the preacher's not going to like him either. And uh, he says, well, we got to have somebody. And, and uh, he says, he can't be against everybody, is he? And I says, well, okay, whatever you want. Well, anyway, the preacher called Saturday night to see if he had got everything worked out. And so uh, uh, evidently when uh, he told who he had now, uh, the uh, uh, ceiling went off or, or something like that. And uh, so the preacher says, I'll take the thing in hand and I'll find the teacher. Well, well, who he got to teach the Bible for those young people that week was a young fellow who was a senior at Florida Southern College and in pre-ministerial work. And uh, I happened to know him quite well. And uh, uh, one time he had attended a, a, a meeting and he came up afterwards and, and told me that uh, that I must be living somewhere way back in the dark ages because I was presenting the Old Testament as if it had some credence. Yeah. And uh, that uh, I ought to know by now that that's just uh, the remnants of uh, Jewish folklore that's finally come down to us in this particular manner. And that uh, it, 
it has no bearing really except for historical and uh, interest and has some good literature in it. He says, but uh, you mustn't call that uh, God's word or, or anything like that, he says. And uh, so I asked him enough questions to know that he was about as far from uh, knowing how to tell somebody the way to Christ as anybody in the world. But he's the one that taught the Bible that week. And this is the type of thing that uh, the Lord had in mind when he said, Woe unto you lawyers, for ye have taken away the key of knowledge. Ye enter not in yourself, and them that were entering in ye hindered. Now these young people, you see, uh, they wanted to go into fuller truth. And somebody hindered them. He wasn't going in, and he wasn't willing for anybody else to go in. So uh, this is this is exactly the type of thing. Now I I run into that all the time, you know. Uh, they um, sometimes I'm asked to speak at certain places, but I'm never asked back again uh, because people get saved and that type of thing, you know, and it's disruptive. So uh, and that's something that's disruptive for people to get saved. Uh, in some circles, it is. <laughs> anyway. That's exactly what he's talking about. The Lord says that you have the scriptures. In another place, remember, he says, uh, uh, search the scriptures. In them you think you have eternal life, and they are they that testify of me. Uh, so they had the key, didn't they? They had the key that would open up the way to life. But they weren't going into life. And they were hindering anybody that would go in. And that was his pronouncement. Verse 53, and he said these things unto them, the scribes and the Pharisees, and as he said these things unto them, the scribes and the uh, Pharisees uh, began to uh, urge him or oppose him vehemently and to provoke him to speak of many things, laying wait for him and seeking to catch something out of his mouth that they might accuse him. In the meantime, when uh, there were gathered together an innumerable multitude of people insomuch that uh, they trod upon one another, he began to say unto his disciples, first of all, Beware of the leaven of the Pharisees, which is hypocrisy. Now, Christ uh, said something like this on another occasion, and the disciples misunderstood him. Uh, hold your place here in Luke, and let's look for a moment in uh, Matthew chapter 16. Verse 6, Matthew 16, 6. Then Jesus said unto them, Take heed and beware of the leaven of the Pharisees and the Sadducees. And they reasoned among themselves, saying, It is because we have taken no bread. Uh, which when Jesus perceived, he said unto them, O ye of little faith, why reason you among yourselves, because you brought no bread? Do you not remember, neither the, uh, understand, neither remember the five loaves and the 5,000 and how many baskets we took up, neither the seven loaves or the 4,000 and how many baskets you took up. How is it that you do not understand that I spoke not to you concerning bread, but that ye should be aware of the leaven of the Pharisees and of the Sadducees? They understood, then they understood that he bade them not to beware of the leaven of bread, but of the doctrine of the Pharisees and of the Sadducees. Now, the only way the disciples had heard the term leaven used was in relationship to its usefulness in baking bread. And uh, so they thought uh, he was talking about eating when he said something about beware of leaven. And they didn't know, uh, quite get the point. So uh, he's bringing out that leaven stands for teaching. And uh, we're, we're told this all through the Bible, and anywhere you see leaven mentioned, it speaks of false teaching, not good teaching, always false teaching. And it'll always be used in that context. Now, when we get over to the 13th chapter of Luke, we're going to find a parable where leaven is used. It's also one of the parables in Matthew 13. It speaks of leaven. And uh, if you read many of the commentaries in, ex in explanation of this, they say leaven is the gospel. And it gradually pervades uh, whatever it enters into. Well, leaven is always evil. It's always false doctrine. Whether you find it in the Old Testament, whether you find it in the Gospels, 
or whether you find it in the epistles. And you do find it in all of those places. Uh, for instance, hold your place again in Luke 12, and let's look for a moment in 1 Corinthians chapter 5. Verse 6, 1 Corinthians 5, 6, Your glorying is not good. Know ye not that a little leaven leaveneth the whole lump? Purge out therefore the old leaven, that ye may be a new lump, as ye are unleavened. He says they're unleavened. For even Christ, our Passover, is sacrificed for us. Therefore let us keep the feast, not with old leaven, neither with the leaven of malice and wickedness, but with the unleavened bread of sincerity and truth. So leaven is wickedness and malice. Unleavened is truth and sincerity. And he says here that uh, a little leaven leaveneth a whole lump. Now two more books over you find Galatians and he uses the term again, Paul does, in Galatians 5, 9. And then he says, a little leaven leaveneth a whole lump. Now he's talking, he's saying, when you find the slightest bit of error or false doctrine, you, you're to root it out. Because he says it won't stop there. It'll just be like leaven that you put into bread and it'll spread. And pretty soon it'll pervade the whole uh, loaf. And that's the way it is. So the moment you find there's false teaching, you root it out. And he says, that's why I'm saying woe unto you Pharisees. That's why I'm identifying their false teaching because it's what's ruined everything. And that's why I'm putting my finger on it. And unfortunately, we do too little of that. Putting the finger on error. Oh, we're very interested in telling what's wrong with the methods of uh, other people. We can find all kind of things wrong with this evangelist and how he conducts himself and this youth organization and how it conducts itself. That's not what he's talking about. Now, we use it for that. We say, well, you've got to root out the leaven. He's not talking about methodology. He's talking about instruction, teaching, doctrine. Now, when Jesus was here, he talked about three different types of leaven. He talked about the leaven of the Pharisees, as we have it here, and he talked about the leaven of the Sadducees as we had it uh, there and, uh, uh, in, in Matthew. And then he talked about the leaven of the Herodians in Mark. Now, the Sadducees were a group of people who said, well, we believe everything about the Bible except the supernatural. They said everything must have a rational ex explanation. For instance, they didn't believe in the resurrection of the dead. Now that's where you, you get the name, of course. Uh, there's joy in resurrection, and they were sad, you see. Uh, so they, they didn't believe in the resurrection. Or anything else supernatural the ministry of angels or miracles and that type of thing. Uh, they, they said, well, let's keep this thing on a rational level. They would be the modernist of today. What we would call a liberal or a modern Christian, that would be a Sadducee today. And the uh, Pharisees would be those groups that uh, are very meticulous in keeping certain things, you know. You do it exactly this way. That would be a Pharisee. The Herodians were those, it says, you, if to keep our culture alive, you must consort with the authorities. That is to say, you must curry the favor of Herod. And you see, Herod was the one that built them this magnificent temple. And it was the Herodians that got credit for that. They say, look, uh, you Pharisees, you want to antagonize the, uh, the people, the powers that be. And what you need to do is to uh, play footsie with them uh, so that they'll uh, come around to uh, uh, our aid. And if you, if you don't do that, uh, then we're going to be wiped out. See, they didn't have much... Uh, they had their faith in the governmental authority rather than the, in God Almighty. Those were the Herodians. They're the ones that were willing to compromise anything to keep from rocking the boat. The big thing with, with a Herodian is don't rock the boat. 
I uh, had a man come to me this um, week at my office. He was just torn up. Uh, he had just found that the pastor had to leave another church. Uh, I don't, uh, don't try to identify this person. He's not in Lakeland. This fellow came from another city to see me. And he, he just found out that he had been uh, eased out of another ch church for homosexual tendencies, uh, the pastor of the church. And uh, he had, uh, you know, uh, promised not to uh, be involved again, so they simply moved him to another church. And uh, uh, you just be, uh, be, be good. In other words, it would be a terrible thing, you know, if all this came out in the open. And uh, uh, it would, it's better just to keep it quiet. Uh, and the, uh, the individual that came to see me, he was upset because the authorities took that, the higher authorities took that opinion. They said, well, whatever we do, the most important thing is not to get this noised around so that the, the whole work is, is, is uh, receives detrimental aspects. So just... Uh, uh, be quiet. Now, the, the man's not been accused anywhere in his new place, but it's fairly well established he had some problems at his old place. As, as best I know, he even confessed it. But uh, he's been moved to another group now, you see, and uh, he's uh, uh, and this particular man that came to see me is just completely torn up about it. Well, uh, you see, the Herodians would say, just don't rock the boat. Keep everything as calm as you possibly can. And uh, look at the turmoil it would cause if you were to expose something like this. And this is the big thing, you see. Well, Jesus calls that leaven. And he says it, it'll, it'll spoil the whole business. No, you got to put your finger on it. you got to identify it and root it out. It's like Paul says, purge out, therefore, the old leaven. But that's the, uh, that's the order of the day, uh, you know. Uh, uh, speak from the pulpit in such a way that nobody really can get disturbed. Look, if, nobody, look, if you'll stay on the subject of motherhood, motherhood Nobody's really going, well, they might today, even that might not. <laughs> he used to could say that, but they were not. Well, anyway, talk about pretty sunsets. You won't get in any problem there at all. Or something along that line. After all, that everybody needs to uh, have a, uh, a beautiful mental picture drawn and uh, uh, so forth. But keep everybody happy. That's the thing. Well, the Lord didn't do that. And uh, he says... We're not to do it. And the reason is given in chapter 12, verse 2. For there is nothing covered that shall not be revealed, neither hidden that shall not be made known. You, you're trying to cover things up? You're trying to hide it? You're trying to keep it from, uh, from the cat from getting out of the bag? Well, don't you worry. It's going to be uncovered one time or another. And what the Lord is saying is the sooner the better. Uh... Everything's going to be revealed. No secret is going to be untold, he says. Let's read on. Verse 3. Therefore, whatever ye have spoken in darkness shall be heard in the light, and that which ye have spoken in the ear, in uh, privacy, or in closet, shall be proclaimed upon the housetops. And I, shall, and I say unto you, my friends, be not afraid of them that kill the body, and after that can do, uh, there's no more that can do. Now, someone may say, you mean to say that I've got to face everything I've ever done wrong and uh, everything's going to be sh uh, shouted from the housetops and every evil thought that I've ever uh, thought and uh, all of that is, is all going to be uh, put out in the open one day? Is that what you mean? I've heard that preached. Well... Let's see what Paul says about it. He quotes David. Uh, let's hold Luke here and, and go over to Romans chapter 4.
Let's look at uh, verse 5 of Romans 4. But to him that worketh not, but believeth on him that justifieth the ungodly, his faith is counted for righteousness, even as David also describes. Now, what he's going to do here, he's going to quote the first two verses of uh, Psalm 32, I believe it is. Yes, Psalm 32. And, and so beginning here uh, with the seventh verse, in the sixth verse, even as David has also described the blessedness of the man unto whom God imputeth righteousness without works. Verse 7. Saying, now beginning with verse 7 here, he's quoting from the 32nd Psalm. Saying, Blessed are they whose iniquities are forgiven and whose sins are covered. Blessed is the man to whom the Lord will not impute sin. Now he says, there are some happy people in this world and they're the one to whom God refuses to impute sin. That is, he refuses to put it to their credit. He refuses it refuses to count as though they'd done it. Now, he covers it up, but I thought everything was going to be uncovered. Well, if you want your sin covered, well, then the thing to do is you uncover it before God, and that'll get it covered up. Now, let's go back to uh, 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 to David, and we'll, we'll get uh, what he, the rest of what he says in Psalm 32. Did we read this again? I wanted you to see it in, in Romans because I wanted you to see Paul apply it to our lives because David wrote uh, before Christ. Uh, verse 32. I mean, uh, Psalm 32, verse 1. Blessed is he whose transgressions are forgiven, whose sin is covered. Blessed is the man unto whom the Lord imputeth not iniquity and in whose spirit there is no guile. Verse 3. When I kept silent, my bones waxed old through the roaring all the day. For day and night thy hand was heavy upon me. My moisture is turned into drought, uh, a drought of summer. Verse 5, I acknowledged my sin unto thee and mine iniquity, and I have not hidden or covered. I said, I will confess my transgression unto the Lord, and thou forgavest the iniquity of my sin. And so then he goes on and, and tells how blessed this is. Uh, it says, For this shall every one that is godly pray unto thee in a time when thou mayest be found. Surely in the floods of great waters they shall come nigh unto him. Uh, thou art my hiding place. Thou shalt preserve me from trouble. Thou shalt compass me about with songs of deliverance. Now you see, in Proverbs 28.13, we're told if we try to cover our sins, someone look that up and read it in a minute. Uh, you have it there, brother, or Joseph, Jocelyn, you have it? He that covers his sins shall not prosper, but who so confesses and forsakes his sins shall have mercy. You see, if I cover my sins, someday they're going to be uncovered. But if I uncover my sins before God, he covers them. I have a choice. I can uncover them before God. You say, doesn't God already, aren't they already uncovered before him, before him? In one sense, they aren't, because he gave me a will, and if I want to, I can keep them covered. But if I do, he will uncover them one day, because nothing secret shall be hidden. And if you think this only applies uh, to uh, some other dispensation, well, Paul also quotes that, I believe, in 1 Corinthians chapter 4. But um, we'll look at that in a moment. But I want you to be sure to understand this point, that those things that I choose to uncover before God, he covers up. Those things that I choose not to uncover before God, he will uncover. That's my choice. And unfortunately... Some of us fit into the category uh, of the rest of this psalm. Uh, we have this promise in verse 8, I will instru instruct thee and teach thee in the way that thou shalt go. I will guide thee with mine eye, God says. Now here's the instruction from God, verse 9, Be not like the horse or like the mule that has no understanding whose mouth must be uh, held in with the bit and the bridle lest they come near unto thee. What he's saying is, Some of you will not 
come to me and uncover unless I yank on the bit and, and hurt your mouth so bad that you got to do something. He says, a, a, a mule or a horse has his own mind. And the only way you can change that mind is by putting a bit in his mouth. And when you pull back on that bit, it cuts his lip. And he'll go the way you want him to go. Well, now, God would rather see you come to the point where you will uncover your sins because he knows how terrible it would be the other way. So he says, don't be stubborn about this thing. You say, well, I thought that um, when Jesus died on the cross for my sins, that that covered them. Well, and that's true. However, something must be done about every sin including the sin in the Christian's life. God has to do something about it, either in this life, or he has to do something about it at the judgment seat of Christ. He has to do something about it. And what he does now, uh, he yanks on the bit until we, uh, until we uh, uncover it, you see. Now, at the judgment seat of Christ, it's not a matter of uncovering your sins. It's a matter of everybody knowing that you weren't willing to come to God in confession. And when he, when he uh, confesses you before the fathers we see here, uh, then you find your great loss because you didn't uncover. Now let's summarize that. It is true that when God saved me, he saw all of my sin, both my past sin and my future sin. He knew exactly to what extent I would sin after I was saved before he ever saved me, and he saved me anyway. He didn't save me uh, uh, with the idea, well, I'm going to wait and see whether or not you sin after you're saved. No, he saved me because I came to him confessing my sinfulness. And so he covered all my sin at that time. All of my sin, he covered it. That is to say, he covered it so that it does never have to be exposed. Because when I confessed my sinfulness before him, that's what he did for me. Now, after I'm saved, if... I'm like a horse or a mule, and I just won't uh, recognize when he's leading me. It says, see, he'll guide me in this way. Uh, I lost my place there in the, in the uh, 32nd Psalm. But that's what it's all about. It's guiding you in the way, isn't it? It says, see, in verse 8, I will instruct thee and teach thee in the way that thou shalt go. I will guide thee with mine eye. Now let's suppose that I just won't take his guiding. Then you'll have to treat me like I'm a horse or a mule. And you'll have to put a bit in my mouth. Because, you see, I have committed myself to him and I've got to act like him or he's got to do something about it. That's what I mean when he's got to do something about sin whether it's sin in a Christian's life or whether it's sin in an unsafe person's life. Well, what if uh, the bit gets in my mouth and he yanks on it and I still won't turn? What if then? Some mules, I guess, are just that stubborn. He says, don't be like that. But some are. Well, then, I have proved myself that I cannot be a part of the glorious reign. He says, if you suffer with me, that means if you endure with me, is that word. If you endure with me, you shall reign with me, he says. Now we say, well, that doesn't sound so bad. Well, that's because you're not thinking with God's mind. He thinks it's pretty bad. And he says, you better not be like a mule because he still must deal with the situation. And this is why and he deals with it, the judgment seat of Christ. And uh, uh, Paul says we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ. 
We've got to stand before God and give an account. Give an account of what? Of the of the lost opportunity, of the lost uh, involvement, because we would not yield to the bit, or we would not uh, walk in the way without a bit. So what should be our reaction? First one, the first thing should be, I thank you, God, because I'm one of those blessed ones to whom you will not impute sin. I thank you that I'm one of those blessed ones to whom you will impute righteousness. Now, God, help me to appreciate that situation so that I don't have to demean you by uh, causing you to have to keep a bit in my mouth all the time. So I'll recognize that you will guide me in your way and I will gladly walk in your way without a bit. So my cry to my God out of appreciation of the fact that he's covered my sins, uh, that he's counted me righteous before him, that he's removed my sin as far from the east as to the west, uh, my reaction should be what? That I want to walk in his way. That I want to find out the way he would lead me and then walk in that way, knowing that he must do something about it if I won't. He must do something about it here, and he must do something about it at the judgment seat of Christ. You say, well, I still don't understand it, but my sins are covered. Well, then I, I don't know how to teach it, but the Holy Spirit does. I know this, that it's a dreadful thing for a Christian to appear before the judgment seat of Christ without his account settled with the Lord. I know this. When he says things like this, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. When he has provisions like that, and when he says, uh, these things I write unto you that you sin not, but if we sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. When he makes that type of provision, and then he gives warnings, like judgment must begin at the house of God, God will judge his people. I know both of those things are true. I know that because I'm saved, my sins are covered. I know that. I also know that if I will not walk in the way, God must take action. He can't just leave it as that. And both of those things are true, and I need to be admonished that both of those things are true. Verse 5 in Luke chapter 12. But I forewarn you whom ye shall fear. Fear him who after he hath killed hath the power to cast into hell. Yea, I say unto you, fear him. You know, one of the indictments that's made by the human race on the part of God Almighty is that there is no fear of God before their face. This is said in Romans chapter 3, and it's a quote from one of the Psalms. There is no fear of God before their face. What does it mean not to have a fear of God? It means to be perfectly willing to disregard him. That's what it means. That's a heinous sin. To have a God and then feel like it's perfectly all right just simply to disregard him. And one who fears God is one who just knows that you're not supposed to disregard God. You know, we put we like to put all different type of connotations on that, on all the admonitions in the Bible to fear God. But I don't like to see that watered down too much. Uh, I'll put it this way. I'm scared to death to willingly 
know that God wants one thing and then not be willing to, to involve myself thereby. Uh, uh, to me, that's just, that's a fearsome thing to know that God uh, would, would want me to walk a certain way. And then, then to just say, well, I know that's what God wants, but I'm going to go this way anyway. I had a mother call me on the phone yesterday. And um, she wanted some help. Said that uh, she just found out her 22-year-old daughter is living with a man without benefit of marriage. And she thought like she'd raised her up in the uh, right way and all. And she was just all torn up. And she hadn't told her husband yet. And she didn't know what he would do when they heard and all that. And I guess she wanted somebody uh, to cry upon her. But she had been to her daughter and talked with her. And uh, she says her daughter knows what the Bible says. She knows that what she's doing is against what God says to do. She says she knows all that. But her answer is, I know all that, Mother, but this is what I want to do. Now, that's having no fear of God before your face. And to me, that's a fearsome thing. A fearsome thing. No fear of God. I know that's what God says. I understand all that. I know that, but this is what I want to do. <laughs> I, I just can't fathom that. I, I really can't. That's disregarding, just disregarding God, having no fear of God. But that young lady better get some fear of God. Well, I told the lady one thing to do, and she won't do that. Um, people don't usually take your advice on those things. Uh, but I just wanted to give an example. If you get the idea that quite a few people come to see me, and yeah, they do, and sometimes it's a little hard to get ready for a Bible study when you've got a lot of people and a lot of problems. And uh, there seems to be a, a veritable parade of Christians with problems. And... Um, <coughs> It all stems from, you know, not being uh, properly, not properly regard God. I talked just recently with a father, and uh, he he was uh, he has his children in the secular school, and somebody had been to see him about putting them in the Christian school. He, uh, well, he knew that was the thing to do, but he just uh, had some reservations about it. He didn't, he wasn't sure the instruction would be as good, and some things like that. And he probably would eventually, but uh, you know, he he had to think it through, uh, you know. Uh, and uh, he, well, in a lot of ways, he's a fine Christian. In a lot of ways, he's a fine Christian. But he's actually saying, yes, I know that's what God wants me to do, but I'm going to think it over. I mean, so much has said that. I, I just can't comprehend that. I know that this is what God wants me to do, and therefore I'm going to think it over. That's, that scares me to death. I, I don't. I don't have the bravado or whatever it takes uh, uh, to to walk that that road. I just don't. Well, best I know, the Lord wants me to go to Argentina uh, next couple of weeks. So y'all all pray for me, if you will. Let's close. Lord, we do thank you that uh, you do have a way and that you can get that way across to us. We thank you, Lord, that uh, somehow you gave some of us 
at least a desire to walk in your way. So Lord, uh, we pray to the extent that we've not accomplished that walk yet, that we would seek out your way. And God, we pray that we wouldn't be like a mule or a horse that has to have a bit in our mouth. that would have to be brought up short so many times, but that every day we'd say, Search me, O God, and know my heart. Try me and know my thoughts. See if there be any wicked way in me and lead me in the path everlasting. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.